Dan Osset and I, I uh, my brother and I ran Door County Hardware and I became involved with the Maritime Museum and I think Louie will explain it later on how I became involved. And I'm Louie Janda. I had been, um, my family and I were caretakers at the lighthouse at Cana Island is how we first got involved with the Maritime Museum and eventually uh, was on the board of directors and became president for a while and was sec board secretary for a while. Uh, president during the time that um, Dan became a board member. I'm Doug Henderson, and I was uh, hired first by the museum to do a feasibility study in 1992, late 92, and then was hired in 1993 as the first executive director. Hi, I'm John Gast. Um, I was recruited by Dan because I was editor of the Dark County Advocate at the time, and he wanted free press. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I served on the board for a number of years, and then eventually um, was convinced by John Asher to be take over as operations director of the Maritime Museum. I'm John Asher. I'm the uh, president of Rowan Salvage Company. And uh, my grandfather was Captain John Rowan. Our family has been in the marine construction business for 65 years. And I was coerced into joining the board about 23 years ago by Dan Osted. <coughs> And I think we should go to Louis and uh, Louis explain how you uh, <coughs> were involved and got me involved. And I think you can tell the story about uh, the hardware store and how sure. we met and all that. And, and maybe some little history of the organization too. I think the Door County Maritime Museum got its start at Gills Rock. And there was a, a group of people there that had a number of added, uh, artifacts. And they had a vision that they would like to uh, develop a museum and uh, display those artifacts, and this was back in the 1960s. And they had um, became incorporated and developed a set of bylaws and, and uh, a, a museum um, uh, goal and aims, and that was pretty well developed, I think, and developed a board of directors. And then they were meeting um, periodically uh, with in full memberships, they meeting periodically with a membership meeting. And then, uh, somewhere along the line, had picked up the lease for the Cana Island Lighthouse. And, uh, and that, that group oversaw that the naming of the, the uh, lighthouse to the historic register and was responsible for uh, maintaining that building. And uh, then I think a uh, next major step in here was the involvement of Ray Christensen and this development of a museum here at Sturgeon Bay. And as Ray tells the story, uh, the uh, uh, Gills Rock group was meeting periodically and then they would have a speaker in, and Ray was asked to speak on his role with the Christie Corporation as a boat builder at that time. And then he rather liked the organization and joined it, and uh, they still had not constructed a building yet, but um, their president at that time uh, died, and then Ray was then named to be president of the Door County Maritime Museum that was meeting at Gills Rock. And shortly after that, the uh, group built the building that uh, is the form of the Gills Rock Maritime Museum now. And as I understand it, uh, even did some of the financing themselves within the membership group that was there. And uh, then Ray wanted, had a vision for developing a museum in Sturgeon Bay. And he used the corporate structure of the Door County Maritime Museum and got permission from the board there to uh, open the museum here with artifacts, which he then did. And I'm not sure if he would have been able to do that or would have done that on his own without being able to use the corporate structure of the museum at Gills Rock. But that put the, um, uh, the, the museum operation in Sturgeon Bay. And then Ray was essentially the curator and runner of that, and then he was also the president of the entire organization. And there was a little separation of funds at that time because Ray had done some fundraising strictly for Surgeon Bay, and yet the proceeds from the donation of Surgeon Bay went into the General Museum uh, Treasury. And, uh, and the corporate office was still run from Gills Rock. And I think that... Um, uh, uh, Marvin Weberg was the treasurer. His wife, Eleanor, uh, actually did the woodwork, the bookwork on it. I don't remember who the, uh, who the vice president was at that time. And then I think the secretary was um, uh, John Purvis. And 
Uh, and then eventually, uh, after Ray died, and that left a big vacancy in this whole museum operation, and it was some question about who would succeed him as president. And in the meantime, this corporate board hired Gary Sewell to be the curator at Surgeon Bay to keep that going, and that was the first paid employee that the museum had at that time. And then, um, then there was some discussion whether it would be me that would be president or Jeff Weaver. And, uh, it, and Jeff and I met and talked about it, and Jeff wasn't real comfortable with the business end of the museum itself. So we had an agreement between the two of us that I would take it the president the first year and he would be vice president and then the next year we could switch the roles. Well, the next year came and he wasn't interested in switching the roles, so I remained as president. And um, it gets, it gets the whole involvement gets real complicated at this point, but then at that I have to say that my own goal in accepting this role of president was really two. Uh, our family had been caretakers at the lighthouse in Cana Island, and that's how I got to be named to the board, too. Ray felt that I should be on the board to look after my interests and family interests at Cana Island, so then I was on the board. And one of the goals was to make sure that that uh, preservation would continue at Cana Island. And then the other one was to get out of all administration duties with the museum and see if we could be developed enough where we could actually hire uh, an administrator, and I guess both of those were accomplished, and after that it happened, and that kind of stepped out of it. But the um, involvement with this expansion of the, of the museum and the Surgeon Bay with, uh, with the board, I think, really started with Dan. Now, we got to get to know him during the time that, it was, that we were caretakers. Um, the museum had made an arrangement with the hardware store that we could uh, buy, uh, buy supplies there and charge them. And theoretically, there was a 10% discount that went along with that, um, with those purchases. And as that was told to me, I understand that um, the hardware store was the only one that agreed to that 10% discount. And then we're never sure whether they actually gave that or not. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we had. I'm sure we did. Yeah, and I had a budget, we had a budget of $300 a year to work with. And then there was some major project that we did that we were able to come up with additional funds. and. Uh, Ray was able to dip into his budget at Sturgeon Bay with that surplus for the fundraising that he did to fund a couple of these kinds of things that we did. But this got Dan involved, and during the time that, that we were uh, buying these supplies at the hardware store, occasionally I would talk with Dan and his brother about projects that we were working on out there. And then we also spent some time just talking about museums and, and visions for where museums could go and, and uh, what could happen with that. And I think it was real important to me when I became president that we get Dan on the board. And it was easy enough to do that at that time because um, that original board structure was that we had 12 directors and four officers, and the officers were not members of the board of directors. That was a, a separate group. And if a director became an officer, then there was a vacancy on the board. And the board had the authority then to appoint members uh, in between the annual meeting times. So, uh, because I was president and there was a vacancy, and Dan took that right away, and he was on the board. And that's when um, we started taking advantage of these Dan's visions, or we was able to carry these out. Uh, there's a lot of details that take place beyond that, as far as acquisition of the land and the actual uh, development of the building and, and uh, this whole area. But in the, in, and during this time um, is, is when, when Doug, Doug Henderson showed up in here. And I'm not exactly clear in my mind where that first um, uh, contact was made. I think that uh, Orville Shop had had some contact with, uh, with Doug. It was Dan. It was Dan. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and Dan was had the contact with Orville for somewhere in here. Well, contact you know, I, I can jump in here a little bit. Uh, when, we, when I got on, Orville Shop and I, uh, had done a lot to the historical museum, and Orville and I became very good friends, and we were always good friends. He'd come Dan, in the store. Clarify the historical museum being the, the Dor Door County Dor Historical. Dor or historical Museum, when we had it on the fire department, which is another chapter of my life, I guess. And Orville and I, uh, always, Orville always came in the store, and of course every time he came in the store he told a joke, and he was always like that. And um, he was the one that really got me involved um, collecting tools and things like that. Anyway, we became close friends, and I said, Orville, 
you got to get on the Maritime Museum board and help us. We're going to try to build a new museum. And Orville agreed. And then we tried to get George Evenson, who was very active at the time, and he turned us down. You guys don't probably don't even know that. And uh, Orville and I got on, and we started, and Orville and I met, honest to God, almost every day at the store, talking about how we were going to proceed. And one of the ways we were going to proceed was to try to, for a better word, stack the board of directors with some uh, big hitters in the community, people that were influential. And that's where we went and got... Uh, John Gass was the editor of paper, and John's absolutely right that we uh, we said before we got him on because we thought we could some free press. Got John Asher involved. Got John, John came people. on after after oh, my after time. After you, but Doug and I had known each other for a number of years because there again, uh, his father-in-law was a very good customer at our store, and I got to know Doug when he came here in the summertime as a customer. And he always charged to do we, I think. Right. Yeah. And we got to know each other, and somehow. I knew that he worked for some academy and did some fundraising down there. Uh, I forget the name of it, Wayland or something like that? I had been at New Jersey and then in, in Beaver okay. Dam, right. And uh, somehow we got him on the list of people to interview to do a feasibility study. We're well, jumping around here a little bit. Jumping uh, around a little bit. I'll, I'll jump in. and jump uh, in. Okay. I, I think uh, I was in the process of uh, looking for employment and uh, was in a job search and walked into the hardware store one day. and. Dan said, I read your resume yesterday, and uh, I, I kind of looked at him and said, uh, well, um, I know you know I'm looking for work, but uh, a job, uh, but I really don't want to work in a hardware store. <laughs> and he said, no, no, no. Uh, I, and I said, and where the heck did you get my resume? And uh, I had applied for a, a job at uh, Peninsula Players at the time, and, uh, and Dan had gotten my resume from uh, Ron Berg at the, uh, at the bank because Ron was on the Peninsula Players Board. Um, and at that point, uh, there had been some preliminary work done on, the, on this facility. Um, the board had, uh, uh, had, hired, had asked Henry Isaacson to draw a possible uh, museum plan, which he had done. Um, and the board had gone to the city with that, that basic uh, plan and had uh, um, requested this property. Let me, let me so jump in there. Talk about that a little bit, Dan, let me, before let me we jump get back in there to me. One of the things that happened is that uh, Orville and I put together what we refer to past as the dog and pony <coughs> show that we, we had. And what we did, and John, I think you were involved, you said, uh, at the time or not? Well, I just wanted to make a point because I think, not to put the cart before the horse here, but if one of you guys could allude, allude to the fact Louie did a really good job, but we should probably mention where the museum was before yes. in terms of the location yeah, and the see. fact that it was housed in the in the former Rowan Steamship offices. Whoever wants to basically, John, if you want to talk a little bit about well, I'm that. Well, yeah, I'm not really sure how that happened. I was <laughs> going to ask the same question that uh, the former museum here in Sturgeon Bay was in my grandfather's old offices. In fact, my father had an office in that building. And I know Cap died in December of 1970. And it took about two or three years to settle the estate. And I, I really don't know when did, how did that building become available to the museum? I don't know. Raid must have uh, somehow, Ray Christensen made that arrangement to it, move into that. Cause, uh, it, it's my understanding that the city actually owned it. At that point, it was yeah. part of Sunset Park. Um, uh -huh. And uh, so I, city owned my, the building. Exactly. my guess is that, that Rowan Salvage had either given it or sold it to to the city at some point when you moved into the into the, 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 yeah. the office in, that you have now, and um, and and that it was sitting available, I think, and that's the reason that, that Ray was able to get that. And when I interrupted because this dog and pony show happened before Doug Henderson was hired, and what it was is Orville and I put together with Louis was president at the time. He said, "Go ahead and have it." If I don't even know if you were there, John Gass, I think you said you were there, mm -hmm. and what we did is we invited. Anybody we thought in the city that might be interested in the Maritime Museum, uh, be it uh, people from Rowan Salvage, which was John, um, I, I'm sure we might have invited Selvig, and we invited people from Bay Ship, we invited people from Palmer Johnson's, and of course Peterson Builders, and we invited all the aldermen and the mayor. And uh, the key to that meeting was that Orville and I got up in front, just started talking about building a new museum, and out of the clear blue sky, Watches uh, 
stately elderly person, Garrett Miller, and says to me, and I'll remember these words the rest of my life, he says, Dan, I know you need stamp money to go ahead with this. <coughs> and he hands me a check for a thousand bucks, which was huge at those times. You know, maybe it doesn't look huge today, but so he handed us a thousand dollars and he called the stamp money and went on to explain how the Garrett Miller Art Museum, et cetera, and always needed money to go out. And that's how we got involved with Gerhard Miller, and there's a couple other stories. But then we just kept rolling. And uh, were you around when we got the print from Gerhard? Or yes. Was, okay, see, uh, I don't, John Gass and I were talking the other day whether we went down and uh, saw uh, Gerhard Miller about donating in a print. And uh, I can always remember. I don't know if I was there or not, but he did say, I'll give you this print that you can use to sell. Uh, I think Orville may have been there also because we had done the same thing previously at the Historical Museum. He gave us a print to sell. Yeah. But in this well, case- Just, just, to, just okay. because I was there. Um, he basically sat down and there were, Gerard as he was, very generous individual, basically sat down and he had a whole series of prints. I mean, it wasn't just a case that he said, here's a print that you can have. He gave us a whole choice, and we basically just kind of stood in front and just kind of had him on his easel backed up, and he just kind of went, you know, here you go, take a look, you know. And after a little bit of time, we just kind of decided after looking at it that, as it turned out, it was a Cane Island print. We just figured mm -hmm. the Cane Island was the f perfect choice um, for it, and it was probably the most recognizable aspect of our of the museum still at that time because everybody seems to know about Cane Island. So that seemed to be the choice that we made to go with that print. So that's just a little. Okay, and not only he says, I'll give you the print, but he says, I'll give you 500 copies free, and I'll, I'll sign them. So I don't know if it was at the first boat show or the second boat show, but we had him and his wife, I think it was the first one, Ruth, they're I think, signing. I think it was probably the second one, because okay, the, the, the museum was, not was only involved in the first one from, uh, and that was just before my time, uh, because um, at that point, it may even been for the second one. The the uh, uh, John Lee Peterson had made a donation to the boat show okay. uh, to mm -hmm. to make sure it kept going on, and the boat show had no way to accept the donation because they they weren't a charitable five four hundred one c three. So the museum became the funding so the opportunity for the boat show, and that was the way the connection uh, became uh, that it was, that connection happened. Well, we sold prints of that one weekend, right? And I think we made—I'm going to think about twenty thousand dollars—that allowed us to proceed forward with. Uh, yeah, it was over a series of things. It was—it was really popular at the at that boat show. But we had a number of different occasions that popped up where we had Gerhard and Ruth come and sign prints, and and um, and it just always proved to be. I mean, we tried to promote it as best we could and as a fundraiser. And yes, we we sold many many of them. In fact. We're still selling them today. So, yeah, and then we got, uh, I think, John Asher involved. And then um, you talked to Henry Isaacs, and you can go into that. Oh, you asked him to draw a plan up for us. And well, we, yeah, we talked to Henry and told him what our, our, our goal was, what our plan was. And Henry came back with a drawing that depicted a long brick building with a few dormers and a tower, an actual tower on the front side of it. And... Uh, at that time, I had, had another architect from Green Bay doing some work for us by the name of Ben Schenkelberg, and uh, I asked if we could get him to do a drawing and see what he would come up with for the building. So after uh, Ben brought his drawings to us and we looked at Ben's, I think we decided that we liked what he proposed. I think Ben actually got involved after exactly. uh, after I was hired. Yep. Uh, so there, there was a was bit gonna, of time. I was going to interrupt, John. I think we took Henry Isaacson's drawing, and Orville and I, and I, I think you were there, went to the city council. And I can remember, I don't know if John was there or not, or Louis, but Louis gave us permission to go to the city council. They asked him to reserve this piece of land for the new Maritime Museum. And I, I, another little story I can always remember when we went to city council, Norm Schachner was mayor, I can't remember who the aldermen were, and we showed him this print and we says, uh, we want to build a maritime museum, this, this is what we're going to try to build. And uh, the council was very receptive and uh, was unanimous to preserve the piece of land. And the only, it wasn't certainly negative, but the only, John Kologi, who was now our highway commissioner, was the city engineer, <clears throat> and he said something to the effect that, 
I think we ought to put a window of five years on that. And at the end of five years, if they haven't done anything, bring come back and reevaluate where they are at that. And we all sat there and said, yeah, we agree with that. You know, five years, we should get something done. And <coughs> Dan, yeah, it, uh, oh, go ahead. it should be noted, I think, that, that this particular property originally was the Sturgeon Bay boat ramp. Yes. And right out here. And and at that particular time when you went to the city council was when the DNR building had just been, um, was being built and the boat ramp, um, the major boat ramp here in Sturgeon Bay was being developed. So this property was a giant uh, wasteland, really. It was just a right. parking lot with uh, with a gas station and a motel along the road. And I knew that was going to go off there. I left it on just like. Go ahead. It was, uh, you know, a wasteland with a with a motel and a, a small motel and bait shop and a gas station uh, out in the corner, um, and uh, the the parking lot was mostly weeds uh, with the little boat ramp, um, and uh, so that was that produced the the opportunity for the museum to go to the city council and say, hey, we want something done here. Um, and I think also at that time to tie in with what Doug was saying. Is the fact that also the city was in its process of its west of its water waterfront redevelopment here on the west side, so they were looking for anchor projects yeah, and to basically, I think to basically well, put in. You went you time. went to the board, Dan, in uh, it was September 11th of '92 when you went before the okay. council just to get uh, dates here. I, I, I think previous to that though, there was a waterfront redevelopment thing that you're on now, and I was on or something similar to that, or a plan being done for the city. And Ellsworth Peterson and I were both on that committee, and we mentioned that um, we thought this would be a good location for the Maritime Museum. So they planted on the plan Maritime Museum, much like the boat story, how they put the boat out in front yeah. of them. And they planted on the plan. So by the time it got to the city council, a few years later, uh, the city council said, well, that's, where, that, that's the place it's going to go with. Look, it's on the map. And that's how they got <laughs> And <laughs> it's really true. And that's why the city council was so receptive. But well, it's been on the plan for years. You know, it's there to go, and that's how that happened. So now, now that you had, you actually had a, uh, um, you had a, a picture um, that the city council looked at. You had the property, and and it, I think particularly because of some of the things that are going on in on the west side here in, in Sturgeon Bay, and about land, it should be noted that the museum owns this building. Uh, but it does not own the land. Not true anymore, Doug. We okay. straightened that out. We do we own, own that. We own the land now. Yes. But when we originally yeah. started, right. we, we leased the yeah. land for 50 years at a dollar Dollary. a year. We That's prepaid correct. it so we wouldn't forget. Right. Um, and uh, so the the land was was part of the city. Um, and and so that's and we had a note on the parking lot, right? Yes, we <laughs> had a loan on yeah. the, uh, the parking lot that we had to pay off. And when we got the land actually given us to the city for the footprint, they didn't refund us for the 29 years left at the dollar. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, you now to go back to, to my first involvement, um, all of this was in place, and and I happened to go into the hardware store, and Dan said, well, we're, uh, we want to talk to you because uh, we want to maybe hire you to raise some money for the museum, and I said, do you have, what, what are you doing? And he said, well, we're going to build a museum, and we're going to raise $4 million, and uh, and it's going to be on the west side, and we've got to do it in a certain number of years. And and how about you come and raise that money for us? And I think my response was, hmm. "Are you crazy?" <laughs> and uh, and I asked uh, if if there had been any preliminary work done, and uh, he said, "Well, we, everybody thinks it's a great idea. We're going to do it." And I said, "Not in your life. I I won't take the job, uh, but I would uh, do a feasibility study." And uh, uh, after we discussed the feasibility study, I think it was Peter Redden who uh, was on the board from the northern part of the museum. Uh, Peter had uh, done some work uh, at uh, Lakeland College, I think it was. He was on their development committee. He understood feasibility studies. And Peter uh, and Louie and you and Orv uh, and uh, uh, going garbage. Uh, oh, Johnson. Yeah. Uh, Percy, Percy, Percy Johnson. Johnson. I think remember we met two or three times at the Pudgy Siegel and and had uh, some discussions and uh, and at that point uh, either it's probably in in early October of '92 that 
uh, the museum hired me to do a feasibility study. And, and what that entailed was uh, me going out, to, I talked to all the board members, I talked to um, people who were not on the board who had some, some uh, interest or uh, wanted to, to see the museum succeed. I talked to a lot of people who were just random people that the board members came up with, possible donors, and qu asked questions, questions about what they saw the museum as today, what they would think it would be in the future, what they thought of the plan, um, would they donate to the museum, what range they might donate in. And after all of that, um, in then Feb or in February, uh, I turned my report in and um, there were a whole bunch of things that, that I, and I haven't, don't have a copy of that today, but uh, I remember that the museum was looked at as, a, as maybe an attic in somebody's house with a whole bunch of stuff in it. It was too crowded, it needed bigger space, um, it, it needed a lot of, of change. Um, the board was not strong at that point. Um, I think your comment, Dan, was that it was a paint and varnish board. Yep, that's um, the words they used. We knew how to, we knew how to change toilet paper, we knew how to paint yep. stuff, we knew how to get jobs done, but it wasn't a, a board that was uh, set to raise $4 million or, or whatever. And uh, the feasibility study that I did indicated probably we we're more likely in the $2 million range. Um, the plan that Henry had done uh, was a great plan, but it didn't really fit museum standards. Uh, so we, we, we then um, moved from there. Uh, I remember we, we met in Gibraltar. Um, you guys uh, listened to my, my comments, looked at the report. Uh, Louis asked me to leave the room and I went and sat in the hall for a half an hour or 45 minutes maybe longer uh, than or that, maybe longer yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, you invited me back into the room and and you had accepted the report and said uh, would you like to become the first executive director and uh, and I we discussed that and I, I I remember saying I would take the job I knew how to raise the money I knew about education but I didn't know about running a museum and I would take the job on the condition that the museum would allow me to find some place that I could learn about how to run a museum. And then uh, you said yes. Um, and for three semesters, I went to Milwaukee uh, once a week to uh, take museum studies courses and uh, to learn how museums should be run. So, so that was how I got involved um, in, in, a, in a nutshell. But That's, uh, They taught them how to put the canoe in the <laughs> the first thing. Back to that. that huh? well, I think one note. One note that's interesting that it was 23 years ago today, September 18th, that the city council approved four projects here on the waterfront, and they were the Maritime Museum, the Conference Hotel Center, the Marina, which is over at next door and, here, and DJs. And no. was not, was DJ's it? was part of that, wasn't it? I don't no, think so. I don't think so. But no. and then the walkways that were going to go around. Okay. Those, <laughs> those four things. Interesting how they all came together. You had that synergy, as Bill would say, to get all these things moving together at the same time. So there was a lot of great interest well, here. Bridgeport was involved in that too at the time. But the, the other thing is that that the museum was, and people may not remember this, but the museum was never part of the TIF district. Um, we we were used. Uh, by the people who were running the TIF district as a, a keystone to, to the development. But uh, Bridgeport and the marina and uh, Stone Harbor and DJ's restaurant were all part of the TIF district. And our parking lot was part of the TIF district because they took that back. Yep. And then we had to pay the city, that was that loan, we had to pay the city for I think it was 35 parking places okay. that were, were out there. Yep. Uh, originally, we had that whole space not to develop, and if we had had it, it would have 35 parking spaces until instead of what's there now. Now, when you're talking about four million dollars for the building, you're throwing those numbers around. Is that something that was Dan told you, or that, that was what Dan told me that was <coughs> going to happen? And and I think that was in discussion with Henry and 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 okay, whatever. Because the, the original. Uh, estimate that we came up with before the building was built 
was 2.8 million. Right, that was for this one, and that was after a, a lot of other planning went into the, that right. was after we eliminated uh, or determined that Henry's plan wasn't going to work uh, and we needed to do something else. And, and that was when I said, well, or the board said we needed a, a building committee. Um, and uh, we started with a committee, um, and I used to say that there were a number of people I interviewed in that feasibility study who who had very, very strong opinions on what this building should be. And um, they, they included Ruth and Gerhardt, they included uh, um, the Petersons, Hilda, Hilda, uh, they Hilda, Hilda, Hilda um, and, and a variety of other people. And we met on a fairly regular basis over at the Yacht Club oh, in, there. in the Commodore's room. And uh, it was, uh, I, 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 everybody had a different opinion. And I, I can remember thinking, if I can just get through this committee, uh, everything else will be a piece of cake, which, which wasn't quite true. Yeah. But uh, um, our first chore was to, uh, to determine who should um, be the architect. Mm -hmm. And we, we contacted Henry, we contacted um, Dave Valentine, uh, we contacted, uh, at your ben suggestion, Ben, we, we contacted um, someone from the um, Frank Lloyd Wright Society at, uh, I think it was Donna Tennell's suggestion, and, and a couple other, there were a couple other firms that did mu just did museums and public buildings, and we asked them all to give us a, a preliminary idea of what they, they might want to do, and we said uh, we wanted a building that was economical, uh, was going to be able to build, be built in, inexpensively, uh, but stand up. Uh, we wanted a building. We wanted the architect to have a certain amount of insurance, uh, so that we could make sure the building was going to be built properly, and um, and we got plans, uh, all kinds of plans, and we finally determined in that committee that Ben was the the person that we wanted to to uh, hire, and we chose him, I think, on two or three different for two or three different reasons. First, his, his cost was going to be very reasonable. He really donated probably half or more of his time right. and energy to, to the museum in that project. Um, the, the basic thought and ideas that he had seemed to be pretty good, uh, and, and we thought that his proximity to the, to the museum being in Green Bay was, was, was going to work. And so we hired Ben, and then the committee that that was in charge of hiring the architect kind of morphed into what we were going to actually choose. And, and that became a small nightmare. Um, we had Gerhardt, who, uh, when you talked about a flat roof, said absolutely not. Uh, Gerhardt wanted the, the tower. He, we had a lighthouse tower that was in the, in the discussion. He wanted a tower more than anything. Um, we had people who wanted, and Hank Walst, who was uh, at that point the, uh, the head of, uh, the CEO of, of uh, Palmer Johnson, wanted something very, you know, just let's get it built as inexpensively as possible. Um, so we had a lot of people. Uh, Carla, was, Carla Peterson was on the, that committee. Um, she wanted something that looked like it was here forever. And we kept getting different plans from Ben. Um, and I remember uh, at, at the time my, my, my children looked at the basic plan and said, oh, Dad, that looks like a post office. <laughs> um, and it was, a, 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 it was exactly what we asked Ben for. Uh, we, it was uh, slabs of concrete type building, a flat roof, um, would outstand or outlast all of us because of the, the type of construction, but it looked just like blah. And, uh, and we went from one thing to another, um, and uh, and nothing seemed to be working. And one day at the meeting, and a couple of us talked about this earlier, Carla just looked at Ben, and, and she had had some interaction with Ben also on some projects, and right. she, she kind of hit her fist on the table, and she said, damn it, Ben, go home and come back with something we'd like, and we'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs> and Ben just kind of said, okay, and he came back, and he came back with the basic plan that was this. When, when Carla said that, and when she said that to Ben, she also had a picture, two pictures from a magazine mm -hmm. that showed a, a 
buildings similar to this in Cape <coughs> Cod or someplace out east. And I can always remember him handing this piece of paper to him <coughs> saying, and her words were, Ben, you can do better than this. Yes, and, and he did. He came back the next week and he had a basic plan and everybody said, wow. And, you know, we, we lost the flat roof. We had the hip roof. We had the brick instead of the slabs of concrete. And, and everybody said, well, why, why didn't you do this a long time ago? And he said, well, number one, it's going to be much more expensive. And number two, and he had some some ideas. Um, and, and the tower, by the way, we, we eliminated the tower early on, and, and that was a cost standpoint because we had to have um, a stairway in the tower, and we had to have an elevator in the tower, and it was going to cost more money than, than we had the ability to raise, we thought, any at, at that time. Don't so, forget, <laughs> Doug, that while this was going on, our fearless leader over here, Dan, <laughs> thought we should check out a, a um, a boat, whether we should bring in a freighter or something else instead of building a building. That's right, and, and we uh, and we flew in, in your corporate jet. Was it a jet? No. no. Well, well, I can I call, wish. We can call it a jet. Let's wish it. <laughs> we flew up to, uh, to the Sioux right. um, to investigate uh, a floating museum there. We also, I mean, to, to, to be honest, we did due diligence. We didn't just hire Ben. Uh, we we got in our luck. cars. We went to uh, uh, the Manitowoc uh, Maritime Museum at the time. We went to Madison to uh, museum uh, to the uh, uh, Veterans Museum. Uh, we went to the Neville Museum uh, to to talk to the the museum directors and also to see what kind of facilities. And I remember um, I can't remember her name. I think it was Ann something uh, who was the director of the Neville Museum at the time, and and she said, "Build empty boxes." Yep, yep. She said that I was there. And, mm -hmm. and that's, what we, that's what the challenge to Ben was. Give us some empty boxes so that um, we can move exhibits and the walls can, can always be, be changed. So any of the walls in the museum, the ones here, are not structural. This is the three boxes, actually. The, every, everything was a box. Boxes. We had the, the box on, on the two gallery sides and then the center connector. Uh, to, and to make sure that we had the ability to make changes as we wished. And alleviate I, I the windows mostly in the box. Bill, right. Bill Harris said we could jump <clears throat> around a little bit. I, I, I got one little story to tell that you guys don't even know, I suppose. Somewhere along the line before we got really, really involved, I met with a number of people, and I think John Purpose was one of them, to convert the old library into a museum. Am I right? Do you yeah. remember that, Louis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. And we looked at that before we even thought of this piece of property. And I don't know how we just got canceled out of that, but the old library was available, and um, we did take a look at that. And the other story uh, that we got a brush on is that um, knowing that the board of directors was nine from the north and nine from the south, being nine from Gills Rock in that area, we knew we had to make those nine in Gills Rock happy. So, um, John, you can probably, John Gaskin tell the reindeer hope story and how we borrowed money to do that and we all put our name on a piece of paper from the bank. Mm -hmm. and well, you know more about the reindeer side. I mean, I well, just remember the reindeer, the, the reindeer was an old fish tug outside the museum up north in Gills Rock and it was rotting away. And we talked about restoring it and um, we said, um, is this the one you want to restore? You know, like uh, we were all restored cars in that, but none of us ever restored boats. And is this the one? And Jeff Weberg says, no, he says, I really think there's a boat that's available. And it turned out it was a hope. And I, he says, I think we ought to get a hold of that and restore that instead of the reindeer. So I think they just scrapped the reindeer. I think they just tore it. it up. Yes, it was. Yeah, they just yeah. scrapped it. And they got a hold of the hope. And um, then we had to build a thing to put it in. So. The board of directors, um, led by Ellsworth, I think we all signed a pledge of five thousand. I think Ellsworth signed one for fifteen thousand. Yeah. That put, was after my time. So yep, yep. that was after your time. Yep. Okay, and we got the money to build on to um, yeah. the Gills Rock Museum to try to keep them the, happy and the hope was museum. actually there before my time, um, but the uh, um, but it was outside. Okay, and and when I don't know who who made the plan for that, but when it was done, it was done in such a way that it was um, 
set on cribs in a, in a concrete um, basement, crawl space okay. type thing, but it didn't have a cover on it. And, and what, what we did was we, we all, um, me included, we signed a, a note that, uh, um, that gave us enough money to enclose the, the, the hope and get it out of the weather so that it would be preserved forever. I think all five of us signed it. Yeah, I don't yeah. Know, yeah. John yeah. And, and, I, and I think part I think part of that project was I mean there was a really conscientious effort at that time to try to make sure that we kept a real balance between the north and the south as far right. as the, as far as the museum was concerned. And we knew at that time we were already laying the foundation for the Sturgeon Bay facilities. So um, you know obviously we wanted to work together and we knew that we had the situation that the some of the northern uh, members of the board really wanted to see some growth and development of the Gills Rock facility and they saw this and as Doug pointed out um, putting a building to protect the, the you know the hope and to really build that museum into a commercial fishing base you know to build that strength of right. that of that particular segment yeah, is something that we, that's something that we felt would help you know, and that entire more of a unity build because this was going to take a, a serious effort to build this yeah, museum. actually in, in the <clears throat> fundraising for the for the museum, we there was a two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars set us was supposed to be set aside mm -hmm. for uh, Gills, Gills Rock. Rock. Sure, I don't think it we ever achieved. Yeah, we, made, we we did an <laughs> awful lot of work in Gills Rock yeah. at that time though because we. I'd, I'd like to speak to a couple of those kind of things too, and then a couple of the comments that were made, including that hiring process, but we talked about the board at that time being, you called it a paint and varnish board, but that's really what it was. And uh, during those years that um, after Gills Rock was built and the uh, and Ray had started, Ray Christensen had started the museum here, it pretty much functioned uh, without much change or development in here at all. Uh, Gills Rock was able to function on the, uh, it was strictly voluntary, including the, the operators of the museum when it was mm -hmm. open. It was open during the summer times, and the donations uh, took care of whatever expenses were there. Um, and the museum here, uh, Ray Christensen was a volunteer, and he was here most of the time at the museum. And it operated in that own office, and that was pretty much stable too. Ray's concern at that time for the future was what would happen when he died, and he thought that maybe the city could take it over. Uh, he was. Um, absolutely opposed to any effort to put that in the library. He didn't see that yeah. as a possibility at all. And he didn't see that, so his, uh, his hope was just that the city could maybe continue that museum as it was in its present location. And this paint and varnish board, uh, that developed over the time too, because Ray was not very, uh, not delegating uh, duties was not very strong. Not his, he liked to do things himself. <laughs> And any time, the museum did a lot of little kinds of things along the line. For instance, one thing that they did was sell books. And that was an income. This was the, uh, and they even had an outlet in one of the banks, I think. And then there was a volunteer that would take care of those. Well, when he died, uh, Ray just took that on himself. And pretty soon the bank part of the sales was gone and the books were just sold out of the museum offices themselves. So that was kind of what had happened to it. And the board eventually wound up meeting um, uh, once a year in the springtime before they operated and then in the annual meeting during the summertime and that was the only times that the board met uh, during this whole this whole concept and after I got in there that was a real struggle because you try to get this board involved with long range planning and thinking about things and we tried a couple of workshops with uh, planning and visions and developments that didn't go very far with the board and anytime we talked about long range planning it became it just went nowhere. And this, this uh, addition on the uh, Gills Rock building that you're talking about, when we put that fish tug under cover, um, they, and the reason it was put in those cribs on there <coughs> is that the original building was laid on a slab that was put down on beach stone. And then when they started to dig down into that to make a foundation to put that uh, uh, fish tug down in here, then this beach stone started rolling down and <laughs> sliding down here, so then they had to put the cribs in it. And somebody on the board says, yeah, we should have been talking about this about three months ago. And I said, now you got the idea. <laughs> as far as that long range planning is concerned, I think you had a little bit, but it still didn't sink in very much. But, um, I, and I think during a lot of this time, my, one of my own personal goals was to see what could be done about the de development of this museum so that um, we could set some kind of a framework or groundwork for its growth. 
And one of the goals seemed to be to, develop, to uh, hire a director if we could do that. But there wasn't enough money in the museum at all to do that. And I talked to some of these other people you mentioned this hand at the um, uh, Brown County Museum and the Manitowoc Museum about hiring a director and what it would take and uh, asked about the possibility of finding somebody that would be willing to raise his own money. He says, you'll never do that, was the comment that <laughs> I got everywhere I went. But, um, uh, and then, now I don't remember I was going to take this. But um, you, could, you could take it. One thing that we forgot is the great office complex that Doug worked out of. For yeah, well, that's it. Yeah. yeah, we'll come, we'll come back to that <laughs> one, I guess. Yeah, Louis was was uh, Gary Soul hired then after the death of Ray Christian? Yeah, so Gary was hired after the death, and that's because there was no one to run that uh, Maritime Museum <coughs> in Sturgeon Bay, and I was not part of that. That was before I was. Um, uh, it resolved to become the president, and it was all settled. And there was a, a, a committee or a group from that uh, board that met and decided to hire Gary. I think they had advertised, and one of the guys said, we even had a woman that had applied. I remember that was the comment <laughs> that was there, even a woman applied. But they hired Gary at that point, and, um, which is another chapter in our uh, history, I Correct. guess. But, um, I, but then with Doug, when he when he came in with that um, feasibility report, then the group decided that that would be a direction to go with it, and uh, he did agree to raise money that would help pay toward his salary. But we did not have the money to no. pay his salary at that time. It just was not enough there. To do that. I, I think there was a small amount that got me through the first month or so. Yeah, <laughs> that's about what it was. That's, that's exactly. And I think that I came thought. from the Garrett Miller prints. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. And, 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 and then I, been left over I think the, the, uh, you know, the, the evolution of the board, uh, um, and I'm not sure where it is now, but uh, um, it, was, it was very clear that uh, uh, in, in writing that the board would be made up with a certain number of people from the Gills Rock area to look out after the Gills Rock Museum a certain number of people from the Bailey's Harbor area to look out for the, the lighthouse, and that actually ended up being you and, and Rosie. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and a certain number of people from, from Sturgeon Bay uh, to, to look out for the Sturgeon Bay operation. And I, I can remember um, just before or just after I was hired um, that there was a vacancy on, the, on that, at that point, on the, on the small board. And I think, Dan, you were right, there were 12 members plus the plus the, uh, the officers that um, there was a, a need for a, a northern person and, and I think it, w it was after I was hired because I had suggested Lars Johnson from, from uh, um, the restaurant and, uh, and I was told by the northern group that that was too far south. Yes. <laughs> so, but, uh, that's correct, that's a yeah. true story. That's a true but, story. The, uh, uh, but the board at that point, um, it was an active board at, the, at that stage when I was hired and uh, but uh, we needed other people, and uh, and to do that, uh, we went from a 12-member board to an 18-member board, um, and the and the officers were included then into the uh, in the uh, bylaws into the the actual board, um, and and that was when uh, uh, we looked at uh, John came on the board then. Um, uh, Ellsworth Peterson, we actually had asked Carla, and Carla said, no, um, I won't take the job, but uh, I would like you to talk to Ellsworth, because Ellsworth was not involved with the original design no, part. It, it was Carla. Um, we, we brought in uh, Donna Tunnell at that point, and I think Glenn Miller um, mm -hmm. came I in at that, at that mm -hmm. point, mm -hmm. um, and Hank Wolst came on. Um, we did talk to some people at Bay Ship, but I don't think we we actually, we, they were on committees, but they didn't mm -hmm. yeah, join the board. Yeah, came and went on <coughs> some of those. Right. Yeah. So, right. so that was when, when the the whole con, the, the whole board really changed uh, its its well, there was, makeup. There were three people that uh, left the board too for <coughs> various reasons. One was John Purvis. He was on when I originally was on, and John Christensen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember him. He right. was on. Yeah. Right. And uh, I can't remember. Who else I think Percy it? also, Percy Johnson, Johnson. Uh, resigned at, at one point. Peter Redden came on about that Peter time. Redden came on at that point, right? Right. And uh, we got Mark Jenkins involved right away. Yes, yeah. uh, right. And don't forget about we. And then, there again, John and I and Orville and John, um, we went after a lawyer. There's no question about yes. it. We, 
Help yeah. us out, am I right? Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, you were just basically covering every possible professional yeah. rank. His dad gives also. me a hard time about being opposed <laughs> to that uh, the board change, to the okay. numbers change. But, yeah. but uh, Mark Jenkins and I rewrote those uh, bylaws to include <coughs> that concept of the right. board. But then we changed that so that the officers became uh, members of the board right. instead of uh, outside directors. Yeah. So, um, and I was going to mention during that during that period, in that transition period, when I was uh, when I was serving as the president, it was real awkward for me because um, I was uh, still working as an instructor at NWTC in Green Bay, and uh, and then trying to do that museum up here and living in Green Bay was a struggle uh, during the during the school year, and of course during the summer summertime we were all at the lighthouse. It was a workable kind of a thing, but it's also interesting when you talk about the board representative. I'm a Green Bay resident. But I was a representative on the board from the middle part of the county, so it's <laughs> living yeah, in well. so <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting things that we did with that. And in that process of looking at the museum, you mentioned George Evenson and the um, county historical uh, group. But I met with a couple with with them and with a couple of others with some kinds of thoughts about the possibility of forming a, a maybe a, a super historical group that would include all of those. And I think the Historical Society was very much um, uh, in tune with that concept, but then it just didn't go in that direction at all. Well, that was, it got to, well, it was so basic, basically, that was part of the original, they, they made a donation to the, the to fundraising, fundraising yes, yes, yeah. for that space yes. in the museum. Yeah. Yeah. Right, well, what we, we actually we housed the, uh, the Historical Museum's, uh, Door County Historical Museum's archive. Um, and their their donation was used to buy the, the racks, rolling racks, the racks uh, right. uh, and, yeah. and with the with that the concept space. that for a five year period they would be available to them, uh, and then we extended that. In fact, we they even had an office. They had an office yeah, in your school for a while. So how do we raise this money for this uh, for this new building, Dan? Yeah. Yeah. And how did you end up getting myself and Charlie Voigt to be co chairman? of the fundraising committee. Okay. Can, I, can I just say something and we'll have him do that. I just want to say how Dan's involvement in this is, this is how Dan's involvement involved in this. And most people don't know this story. Okay. Is when I was editor of the paper, um, so there was a, basically, somebody had come into the advocate office and had indicated an interest in starting a museum. Nobody associated with, with, the, with the current pro oh, yeah, process. Okay. And he had come and they said, you know, and I thought, that was a really good idea. This really should have a museum in Sturgeon Bay, because as much as I, I liked the facility over there, I thought this would be, a new facility would be great, and I realized the timing may be really good. So I actually did a little publicity on the thing, and we ended up having a meeting at the, at the library and there was a group of about, there was about 14 that showed up, but I could tell from the meeting that it was a group of light hitters, you know what I mean? It was <laughs> not, it was not gonna probably go too much further. But that very next day, Dan came across the street from the hardware store. He had already basically heard of this meeting coming up, and he basically had approached and said, hey, we've got, we're already underway on this plan, and we're working on this plan at this point. And stuff, and that's kind of how I got involved with the process. That's at right, that I forgot point, about that. Is that he kind of went and he said, I, you know, apparently you got an interest in this. We really want you to get you involved in the project. <laughs> so that's if you're kind of looking where I got involved, that was where that I kind of all came from. Was this <laughs> little odd meeting that we had, and then Dan got a note, got his, as he knew, but just about everything at the hardware store what was going on in the community. <laughs> Um, basically came over. So I just wanted to toss that out, but yeah, you can kind of, you can kind of pursue John, John, John's, John's, John's request there, you can take it from there. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm always <laughs> curious of how, how you talked us into that because, I mean, you're asking <laughs> us to go out and raise, I don't know what it was, how many, three, almost $3 million, I guess. 2.8, I think, is yeah, the total I, average. I, I, you know, I honestly don't know, but uh, why, but, um, I think I this have something whole, to do with it, John. This, yeah. this whole thing, <laughs> I think we got to stress this whole thing was just a fantastic amount of volunteerism of different people and, and uh, everybody in the community. We just hit it just exactly right. You know, Peterson Builders was taken off and Bishop was going great and Palmer Johnson's was going great. And the whole community was for a maritime museum. It yeah, just, but that was, was obviously one of the things that we, we found out in the in the feasibility study was that um, the community as a whole felt the Maritime Museum was an important aspect of the of what went on in Door County uh, from the northern part all the way down to the southern part that that there was very there were very few people who didn't 
feel that the museum was was a, a real asset or could be a major asset to the to Sturgeon Bay and, and Gills Rock and, and, and Cana Island. Um, there there were obviously concerns about what it was at the time. Uh, there were there were weaknesses in, in the structure. Um, but but the concept was um, really, really backed. And and when people were asked uh, would you support it, um, the the overall comment was absolutely uh, to the point where they actually gave me numbers uh, and in that report there there are no names to those numbers but the the numbers are there and we could then um, use that information to extrapolate approximately how much money there probably would be to, to fund and I can remember <clears throat> just after I was hired um, I mean, we started planning this this <laughs> fundraising effort um, Peninsula Players started a fundraising effort. The the hospital was in a major effort. There was somebody else. The YMCA, in, the was, YMCA was in it. And I can't remember if it was John or Dan said, there hasn't been a major fundraising effort going on for, I think, John, it was you. He said, you know, years. for 20 years, the only thing that's ever been raised, money was raised for was the hospital. And, you know, and now we've got all these nonprofits raising money. Do you think we should wait? And my comment was, we, we're there now. And we got to go. Yeah, we we have to be part of it. We can't sit back. Well, and, and, I, I can and, remember yeah. that Ellsworth Peterson and I would take a list of about four or five people once a week, jump in the car, and he and I would drive to various businesses in town here, mm -hmm. and with the two of us go in there and we'd sit down and present the plan. And I don't think there was one business that turned us down. No, and <clears throat> that did not donate right. towards the museum. But one of my favorite stories is uh, I had talked to Bob Baumgartner uh, from Paper Machinery Company in Milwaukee. He's a very close friend of our family. And uh, he did a lot of boating up here. He was a tremendous boater. In fact, he bought a 90-foot boat when he was 90 years old and still <laughs> went out on it. But Anyway, I talked to him previously and asked him if he could donate something to the museum to our fundraising drive. And I'm sitting in my office working, and phone rings. I pick it up, and John, this is Bob. You know, he's really a character. And he, he says, I, I've been thinking a lot about the museum, and I think I got to donate some money there. And I was thinking of giving you one million dollars. But the truth is, you'll probably need more than that, so I'm going to donate $2 million, but you won't get it for about 20 years. It's going to be in a trust. But you're going to need the money to put a new roof on the museum in about 20 or 30 years. And, of course, that did take place, I mean, as far as the paperwork, and I don't know how many years we have left before we get the money, but that was a heck of a donation from the Baumgartner family. It was. I think one, one story that tripped in my head just now is uh, when we were going through this process, we were sitting at Gills Rock, and Ellsworth happened to be sitting on my right hand, and we were talking about whether we should get the architectural plans, which are very expensive, you know, to do a bidding process, mm -hmm. and they cost like a hundred dollars to $150,000, <coughs> and we had the goal almost reached, we were within like $350,000 of reaching our goal. and. Uh, and I made the comment, geez, we really shouldn't go forward until we get all the money raised. And Ellsworth said something to the fact, you know, this is a magical time to go out and get a bid. They were building the Bank of Sturgeon Bay, Bay Lake Bank at that time, and he says, the time is right uh, to go for it. And I thought, boy, if he says the time is right, I think it, it is because I mean, he, could cover, the, he could cover us if we didn't make it. I remember it, that uh, that uh, meeting too because mm -hmm. uh, we had we had asked Ben to, to come up with a, a plan and actually it didn't cost that much because Ben donated Don't most of it. But he had the plan, the, the working plan in process, uh, ready to go, and uh, and we said should we put it out for bids? And my feeling was we didn't have enough money, and exactly. and we were thinking that the the bid was going to come in at 2.8 for the construction, and we didn't have the 2.8 at that point. And I remember saying, well, what if we get these people to bid on it and we can't build? 
And John said, if they want to build it and we go back to them five years and then another year or two, they'll bid on it again. <laughs> and I said, well, John bids on a lot of stuff. I guess that's, you know, he knows what he's talking about. And we, we put it out to bid. Um, ben was in charge of putting it out and he was in charge of the timing and how to do it. And he said the first thing he, he was going to do was wait until the right time. And he said the other thing he had to do was to make sure that everyone knew that the Door County Maritime Museum was not part of the county because it wasn't a county project. It was a, it was a nonprofit project. And he said that there would be different people bidding on it. We had he, three bidders. Three I bidders, think. and he wanted to wait until the winter time right. to bid on it because that's when most contractors are looking for work for spring. Right. Not so we don't want to bid in the middle of summer. And I can remember we we the building there was a small building committee. Uh, John um, uh, Ellsworth. Uh, Carla. Was Charlie Void on that? I'm not sure. There were there were like I think he was. There were maybe was. four or five of us in that committee. And we met in John's office in his conference room, and Ben said, all right, before we open these up, I want you all to write down what you think the low bid's going to be. You know, I, I put down 1.8 because I was being optimistic. We had 2.3, someone had down, and, and we opened the bids up, and OM Construction's bid uh, was 1.2 million to build the building. And we all just kind of looked at each other and said, well, is that a, a problem? And the other two were within seven hundred thousand dollars, or less, no less than that, a couple hundred thousand dollars. So, mm -hmm. so we we said, all right, they're all right in that same range. So this is not an abnormality; it's it's the real thing. And then we all looked at each other and said, well, what do we do now? It came in four hundred thousand dollars below. I remember that. What Ben estimated <clears throat> right. the build just the building cost yeah, would be. I remember so, that. so we went to the board meeting, and that was when um, we the board made the decision to to build. And and uh, and the concern was we didn't have enough. We had enough money to get the building going, but then we needed to deal with the exhibit structure. And exactly. Ellsworth was the one that said, if we if we can put in half of the exhibits will open with half of them and the other half will just be closed yep. and we and I said all right well maybe we can get a, a traveling exhibit to come in and fill part of it and you know and and that was the the beginning of of the the building process and I remember and when, during that debate this comment from Peter Redden when his board was deciding whether to do it or not and he says I think we should take a winger he said <laughs> 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 Maybe, Doug, little, maybe well, I was just going to maybe Doug could just mention at this time because this is about the time when Christine Randall comes kind of into the picture a little bit. We should probably right. mention a little bit about that hiring process because because it's that's when the museum started to spread out a little bit. One one of the things that I learned in that uh, process of taking the classes at uh, at the uh, University of Wisconsin Milwaukee uh, in the museum studies certification class <clears throat> was that. There were things that we needed to do to be a professional museum. And up until that point, uh, the museum was a great spot, but it wasn't being professionally run. Um, our artifacts, our labeling, uh, we, I think still in the, in the museum archive someplace is a, a red dimal letter, letter maker. <laughs> and that was the way the artifacts were, were labeled. <clears throat> and they weren't just stuck on the wall, they were stuck on the artifacts. And, you know, and getting that, you know, getting getting those things off was a chore. Just to, you know, and, and Dan jokes about uh, having to wear white gloves every once in a while in this whole process. Okay. I just uh, want to mention real quick. When I give tours at the museum, I still use that line every single time about how we how we transferred yeah. from what in essence was anybody who has an analogy to baseball. We were a sing, we were a basically a single A baseball team that moved up to major leagues and we skipped double A and triple A in between. <laughs> I, That's basically what we I did. I used to so. comment that we were a kindergarten for museums when we graduated to college yeah. all in one yeah. year. <clears throat> and, and it was. It, it, uh, um, the, the, the whole plan was at some point uh, we, would, we would have a, a director, um, we would have support staff, um, and we would have uh, one, of the, one of the support staff was going to be a, a professionally trained um, a curator. Uh, so at the point of the construction, 
we decided we needed at this stage to begin that process of designing uh, and, and initiating the, the whole process of the exhibit part of the museum. Uh, up until that point, there was no need. Uh, but but we, we did that, we advertised, we, did, we advertised nationally, we advertised it in the, uh, the uh, American Association of Museums, uh, we advertised in the Midwest Museum, uh, Association of Museums, uh, we sent notes out to the universities in Wisconsin and Illinois that had museum studies programs. And, and we hired uh, Christine Randall, who uh, had just graduated from uh, UW uh, Milwaukee uh, with it. Um, she had a master's in archaeology, archaeology, anthropology, I think. Um, yeah, and anthropology. And, uh, yeah. and she had she held the museum studies certificate, um, so that she she was somebody who was well trained. Um, she was young. Um, she had her, her she she was fairly narrow narrowly focused. Uh, but she, but she had, she came in and she came up with with some major plans for, for what we needed to do. Uh, she oversaw the moving of the artifacts from the old museum to this museum, uh, with a lot of help. John, John uh, did that. I know John did. That story. But she, she was there a couple hours uh, because I wasn't. I, I was on a trip to, when, when the major things moved. But uh, uh, John and Marine Travel Lift. And uh, Palmer Johnson's. No. Did Palmer Johnson no. help in that? It was uh, just Marine Travel Lift and Roan Salvage. Roan Salvage yeah. yanked off the pilot house of the Elba off the back of the old museum and pulled that across the bridge. They brought the, uh, the, the Chris Crafts and the Collenberg engines, and all of those things began. That was once the building was up. It's the middle of the winter, um, snowy. Um, and uh, it was, I think it was in early March when we did that. Yep. And it was, you know, I, and it was con I had contacted <laughs> uh, Al and Jerry Lamers at Marine Travel Lift, and they were very helpful in this whole process. But I sent uh, my work crew over there, Don Sarter, and about four or five other people, and John Kazimerick Kerminsky, or mm -hmm. John K., they call him. Right. Um, from Travel Lift was over there running a, four, a 15 ton forklift. And you could pick 15 tons at 10 feet out. And you remember we had picked that boat right there. out of the second floor of the museum. So they opened the window up and John drove that forklift up there and picked it up. And I think the back end came off the ground, but we finally got it out and we set that on a trailer. And then we picked the Elba up, the pilot house, and put that on another piece of equipment. But you're right, they had to go all the way around to the highway bridge. Uh, they didn't come across the bridge at Michigan I think Street. They, I think no, they did. did. They did. The oh, we have pictures of them coming well, John, across the bridge. John told me that they, he, well, he took the forklift, evidently. Maybe the forklift had to go that way. Yeah, maybe that's all right, yeah. But, the, uh, but hiring Christine was, was a, uh, a real step in making this um, a professional museum. It moved it from that kindergarten to college, college part. And, uh, and she brought to the museum um, a sense of um, how to deal with, uh, I brought some of that, but she was really the trained person uh, to, to know what we needed to do with arti artifacts and also how to begin to display them. And, and she began that basic plan. Um, she, she was the one that designed the, the, what was called the Founders Gallery then, now the Peterson Gallery. Mm -hmm. Downstairs where it was the timeline of the history of shipbuilding in, in Door County. Um, and and then, then we needed to get some other people involved. And I know, Dan, you can tell the story about saying, you know, Christine, there's just yeah. not enough time in the day. Before you uh, do that, before you go into that, yeah, I just want to get back to that fundraising because there's something Doug can talk on a little bit. Um, I think one thing that we did that was very instrumental in raising the money, and that's we set up, uh, we had these giving societies. We had the Rivet Society, the, okay. found, yeah. the uh, Foundation Fres Society, and Fresnel. the Fresno Lens right. Society. But what was really good is, Doug, you sat down, and I don't know if it was with Christine or who you did that with, but we came up with these different items that people could purchase, right. all the way from... Uh, the, with boardroom or it was bathrooms to the upper lobby to the different galleries to whatever. Why don't you explain? Well, that that was part of, it. and we we developed a, uh, a a campaign guide, a booklet, 
uh, it didn't have a lot of glitch to us. We didn't have very much money. Uh, and we came up with a plan. Uh, John got uh, a printer involved that, uh, uh, from Green Bay, um, Joe, Morgan. Joe Morgan, and, uh, and Joe said that he would donate all the printing for us, but, uh, but we still needed to do it fairly uh, inexpensively. Um, no gloss to it. It was just uh, um, a, a nice booklet. Before that, we had uh, uh, color copies <laughs> stapled together, um, and that was what we began to use. And, and Joe came up with the, the thought that we could do it more professionally. And, and we, we had the history of the museum. We had the reasons why we needed to do what we needed to do. And then we had giving opportunities. And before we actually did that, some of those giving opportunities were already taken. So we, we started out doing some uh, quiet fundraising. Uh, we did fundraising within the board and within uh, the, the local community where we knew people were interested. So there were certain naming areas that had been uh, named when the, when the book was printed. And we did it in such a way that as we went out to talk to people, uh, if something had been named, we could literally check off in the book um, that that had been, been named, no longer available. Um, but there, there were a variety of opportunities from naming the whole building. We didn't get a gift that big, but we had uh, galleries named, we had the upper lobby named, uh, uh, the stairway, um, and, and a variety of different things. Um, and, and some of them came very quickly, and some of them it took a while, a lot of talking, and, and, uh, uh, and, and work to, to get people involved. Uh, uh, one of our later gifts came from a, a couple in Ephraim, um, and they made us a challenge gift, a very large challenge gift, um, and, uh, and he wanted, we were looking for money to uh, pay off debt because we had, an op, we had a, a building debt with uh, Bay Lake Bank, uh, who was absolutely wonderful to us. Um, and, uh, and I went to them to raise money to pay off that debt, and he wanted to give us money for our endowment. So we, we, <laughs> we had a little bit of a no negotiation, and we ended up with a, uh, a $250,000 uh, challenge gift, uh, but we needed to raise $500,000, and half of it went to the, the loan, and half of it went to endowment. And, and after, it took us about two years to do it, but we were able to do that, and, and that made another big change in, in how we could operate. Um, in, in a professional way, but the, the fundraising was, uh, um, it, it had a lot of people working on it, uh, and John is absolutely right. There were people, and I think John, you got to be chairman because you showed an interest. Uh, Charlie Voigt was the, the chairman from the northern side uh, because it, there were a, a different group of people that we needed to be talking to on the, in the northern part of the county and in the southern part of the county. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and it was, uh, um, was people like John and Ellsworth and Charlie that uh, and Dan and a variety of other people who who worked with me to identify people uh, who weren't necessarily close to the to the museum uh, that that we could go to and sit down and, and um, remember uh, uh, Orf shop set up a meeting with uh, Marion Hislop and Marion and her sister have been very philanthropic to the, the community. Uh, they were the funds behind the Door Community Auditorium. And we went to see Marion. And we sat down with her, and, and the first thing out of her mouth was, I, I really don't know why you guys are coming to me to, you know, to, for a donation to a maritime museum. And Orv looked at her and said, Now, Marion, if I'm not correct, your grandfather came from Scotland and he owned the Lorry Quarry, and he had a boat building operation, and he had this, and he, that, and she said, oh my goodness, I guess you're right, you, you should be talking to me. <laughs> and, uh, and she made a, a, a major donation to the museum, uh, and I asked if she wanted to name something, and she said, no, I, my name doesn't need to be on anything, I just want to give you the support. And it was people like that that, uh, that, that we went to, some of whom were questioning us why, and other people knew why, uh, and they, they all stepped in in some way, shape, or form. Um, and it was, it was a really, it was, it was difficult. Uh, we, we had challenges. Um, there were times when we plateaued. 
Uh, other times when, when things rolled along really well, um, I can remember when the day when, when uh, just before John became part of the, the museum staff, uh, we were at a museum uh, board meeting in Gills Rock, in, uh, or not in Gills Rock, in Gibraltar at the high school, and we were, we were floundering. Uh, we were already getting ready to open, or we maybe were open. Um, a lot of my time was being taken up in running the museum, and we were still raising money, and there was, <laughs> there was a lot of push and shove going on, and, um, and, and there was conversation of what we should do. How do, how do we get Doug Henderson back out raising money when Doug Henderson needed to be running the museum, too? And, and uh, I can remember uh, uh, Jeff Weeborg may have been even running the meeting that night. I can't remember, but he was at the end of the table, and he said, now listen, this isn't Doug's fault. This is our fault. We need to figure out a way to do a better job of how we're running the museum. And that was when the concept of bringing someone in to be the operations manager uh, came about. And, and John was on the board. So John re resigned from the board and applied for mm -hmm. the job. We had what, two, three, four, five other people we brought in. And, and John was the, the logical person. So uh, John became the operations manager. We, uh, we put a wall up in, inside my office, so we had two offices. You got the biggest, biggest office. I did, I did. <laughs> I think you should quickly, quickly brush where your initial office really was. Well, the yeah. office yeah. space. Yeah. Uh, I need to touch on the, you guys talk a little bit. When I was that. hired in that, that February of 1993, um, we, we, uh, the, the museum was not someplace we could have an office because there was no heat. Or there, if there was heat, it didn't work. Um, so Dan said, you can have my office in, in the basement of the Door County Hardware Store. <laughs> I said, oh, great, that's, that's fine. And, and I, I moved in. Dan moved his stuff out. Um, I can't remember what was on the walls then. But, Packer, uh, Packer programs. Packer programs, right. Yeah. <laughs> there was a, a buzzer in the ceiling uh, and a, a little intercom thing that played music. And, and every time the door, the, <laughs> the, the store opened up, it would bing at me. <laughs> Um, I don't know if Dan knows, but I did get up on a ladder and, and I snipped the wire at some point. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and to get to the office, I'd have to climb over the, the pipe cutter and all kinds of other stuff that was in the, hall, in the aisles. But the best part was every time somebody came into the store, which was often, that had some reason to be involved in the museum, Dan would drag that person downstairs to meet me. And we ended up with a lot of people who made donations of, of uh, artifacts and also uh, funds because of those connections. And we, we lived in the museum, uh, in the hardware store office for a while. Uh, we hired uh, Chris Milton as a, a secretary at that point, so there were two of us, two of us in that little office. And then we, we moved from there to donated space in the Harmon Building, in the back of the Harmon Building in Kentucky. That's right. And we were in, in there for a while, and then uh, we were able to expand there because we had more staff, um, and, uh, and we, we got a little bigger. And then, I can't remember why, but we had to move from, from the Harmon Building, so uh, Ellsworth uh, gave us space in the uh, um, Peterson, building, Peterson building, Builders office space on Third Avenue, the old uh, theater building which is now a little mall space. Right. Um, and we were in the back of that. We had two rooms back there. And we were in that until, uh, uh, until we moved to, uh, to, to this building. And we moved in here way before it was just barely finished. <laughs> there was still, there's still construction going on when, when we moved the offices in. So. so down the road, we got to a point where we had the building, we had the cubes, and we had a, Doug as the director, and we had Christine as a curator. So what happened to how we were going to get these various cubes filled? What what uh, what story do you remember? Dan. Well, I think the story I remember, and I think John Gass was there that night, and um, June June was there. I was there too. <laughs> Christine yeah. Randall, and um, we talked about this and that and everything else, you know. And, but one of the things that Christine brought forward. I don't know if control freak was the right word, but she wanted to be in control of each gallery. She wanted to be everything past, she wanted to put the stamp on everything. And I basically told her that night, I think politely, that we don't have enough time for you to do every gallery. 
you get the Founders Gallery and take care of that. I'll talk to John Asher and we'll do the engines in the Elba and I yeah, let me just point here because there's the significant element of the story is the time frame that we're dealing with here. Okay, because, this is right around because, Christmas time. Because right? the muse the museum basically what it got it was pretty much ready to start that about what, like February? Was that about right? Of of ninety of ninety seven? Was that about right? Mm -hmm. For opening, you mean? No, no, for, no. for the actual. For yes, us to yes, start it working. was. I believe it was. We got. We were. We were. Christine had already been doing some planning, right? And she had been uh, designating different artifacts for different spaces, right. but we couldn't get into the museum to do that activity. I think until February. You're right. right. And we were trying to. We, the aim was to open in June. June. Yes. We started in so February. that's the window that we had to get this. Okay. All the artifacts. I mean, to get the exhibits February already. February to June. And I, you know, and I don't know how I said it, but I sort of lowered the hammer and said to her, you can't do it all yourself. I'll talk to John Asher if he'll do that gallery. And I said, John Gass, you were sitting right there. Yeah. And I said, John Gass, you take over the, the gallery and the, the Lighthouse Gallery. gallery. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I said, Orville Shop and I will take care of the models. The models, right. And one of the comments I got with that with Orville and I and Doug, one, this is a little bit down the road, Orville wanted to use Texture 111, which is plywood with grooves in it. Yes. And Doug Henderson says, you guys can't use that. You've got to get better lumber than that. <laughs> and so that's when Orville went out to Terry Jr. and got him to donate all the oak in that. And Orville and I, and our, we got, I think, about 8 or 10 or 15 people involved in there, put together the model room, um, much like John did a lot bigger job down there. But I know we built, Orville and I built the cabinets, and um, I know my wife came around and helped stain and varnish them. We had about 10 or 15 volunteers just do the model room. John had, John Gass had 15, 20 volunteers do the lighthouse room, and John Asher, of course, went off and did it all <laughs> himself right. with his staff, you know, well, but you did yeah. do it, you know. Exactly. Well, there was yeah. more, more than that, uh, mm -hmm. but, but uh, you're, you're absolutely right, the, the uh, the development of, of the exhibits uh, became um, very, very involved with, with volunteers. Um, mm -hmm. the, the caveat that I would put on it is that um, in all of those cases, uh, Christine and I had the, the, the veto power, mm -hmm. shall we say. Yeah, you do. Um, no that question we, about that. We, and, and I, I would, would defer to Christine uh, on, on most decisions if, if there was a, um, some sort of a, a, a conflict because she was the one that was trained in knowing how we needed to deal with, with the artifacts. Um, we, we, the volunteers had wonderful ideas um, and, and ways to do things, but we needed to do them appropriately. And, and I can, you know, I, I don't know how many volunteer meetings I was at and Christine was at, but we were at all of them. And, and the, the massaging and the working with the volunteer staff, and there really was a, a staff um, of a huge number of people who put in a huge number of hours. And, and I, we can go back to other, uh, I know, grants that we had applied for after the fact, and I can't, I can't remember the total number of dollars um, that we calculated were put in, but it was hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of volunteer work that went into that time frame between February and June. And, and I'm going to stop and, and just make a, a, a little, we've missed a couple things in this process. We missed the fact that uh, uh, Tommy Thompson was here for our ground baking ceremonies uh, out, in the, out in the yard yep. at, just after we had begun the, I think the pilings were already in and some of the concrete work was done. Uh, but Tommy flew in to, uh, to, to Cherryland Airport uh, in a private plane, and I think it was Ellsworth who brought him in. Um, we had uh, Russ Feingold, who was uh, at the time our, our senator uh, at our, uh, our christening ceremony, mm -hmm. uh, and we didn't have a, a, a ribbon cutting. We had a christening ceremony. Ellsworth had uh, um, the people who made the uh, christening bottles for the champagne bottles for their, for their boats, make the, the uh, bottles for us, and it was Hilda and... But that was at the, the christening ceremony. That's when that it was, was built. That was when it, it was, was built, right. No, when it was opened. Yeah. No, it was be, the day we, we opened on... Yes. Uh, 
was uh, that day. That and day is when we used the champagne bottles. Right, and we had... Uh, Did they miss the first time they saw No, what something? happened was uh, we had Carla and uh, Carla Peterson and Hilda Asher were our two uh, sponsors. Uh, sponsors, and they both had a bottle of champagne. And if I remember correctly, just the way they were standing, and they came, they both came around at the same time, and Carla's bottle hit the building and broke, but Hilda missed. Yeah, and she that. then yeah. came back to go for a second time, and her <laughs> bottle hit Carla in the face. Well, I didn't, no, I didn't hit <laughs> or, her. Or no, just it, about it, it came about this close, it would have probably knocked her out. Yeah, and it then hurt. and then Hilda, but, and I think Carla's comment to me was later uh, that she asked if we had good insurance. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, I but, wonder why your insurance sitting here. i got to defend myself while you're yeah. illustrating that. <laughs> that happened right down at the entrance where, right. and where that, the cornerstone And those, was, those are things that, you know, we, we had um, not only you know, local support, but we had some big hitters from, oh, yeah. from within yeah. the state who who really supported uh, what we were doing here in, in Sturgeon Bay. I, um, a couple of things I got to say is that uh, we fail to remember the number of hats that Doug wore throughout this whole process. It, it was re really fantastic. I mean, we all volunteered, all five of us were in there, but Doug had a tremendous, you know, he was the building engineer, he was the curator, he was everything, fundraiser, and, and he was the main man. He really had a job, and John and I were constantly on his butt <laughs> trying to get You weren't the only two. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, Doug was one of the greatest procrastinators I ever met, too. There but, were days. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I really but, think when we started with this uh, different um, pods that we were each given to work on, is the first time I came across Dan he was talking to me about something, and we were, I was saying, boy, Dan, this is a big job here. And he says, I don't care. Get her done. Yeah. And he's yeah. used that, that slang now for about 20 years. And, and the, uh, the other part of, of that, when you say you know, that I wore a lot of hats, you're, you're right, but uh, there, there were a lot of people that were right behind me or next to me uh, helping with, with every well, one of those hats. And I, I used, for, for example, um, Ben Schenkelberg in, in the development of this museum, um, he drew the plans up and, and he found us our, our construction people, our, our general contractor, but he was here every week uh, looking at what was going on, making sure that, that the plans were being followed correctly, um, making changes when changes had to be made, and, and watching over this. You know, I was here every day looking and making sure things were, were going on. If there were questions, I would call Ben. Uh, but but he was uh, phenomenal in the, well, in the oversight. we got to make one thing clear. The difference between John Asher, John Gass, and Louie and I, and Doug, is Doug was getting paid, too, to do this. We're doing this all on our own. <laughs> yes, you were. And, uh, I, I got to tell a story about John Asher and uh, um, the gallery he was doing. Uh, he called me up on Friday afternoon, about 3 o'clock or something like that. And he said to me, Dan, I think we ought to put the elbow up in the air. The elbow was scheduled to be on the ground mm -hmm. where the motors are right now, where the engines are in that. And I said, well, John, uh, that might be a good idea. Let's just think it over on the weekend, and I'll meet you Monday morning, and we'll talk about it. Well, in my in, office. I go, yeah, okay. <laughs> I go in the museum Monday morning, and here the son of a gun is up in the air ready to no, go. It wasn't planks. quite that. Well, wasn't quite the planks, that. He had the planks underneath there. And it, well, you got to yeah. back up a little bit on that story. I mean, <laughs> the first part of it is that they brought the elbow over here, and you set it in front of the door. And it was too big. It was too big. It wouldn't go through the... the uh, and we thought we had a door big enough for anything. The door to go through. <laughs> so we, I had my men cut it in half. They had to take the wood out of it because it, it was wood lined in the inside. Cut it in half, move it inside the gallery, weld it back, back together, together, put the wood back inside of it, <laughs> and get it ready. Now it's sitting in the middle of the gallery. And the plan was... Well, wait a minute. I came... Yeah, the before, plan... Be, the first plan was that we were going to have a, uh, a video in all the windows, and it was going to ha on, be on something, and it would be able to move, and you could then drive the Elba. And we went, okay. and we found out that... It was going to cost us like fifty thousand dollars to do that, and that was like our whole exhibit budget. <laughs> so well, I remember so. standing in the gallery there, and I'm looking at at the Elba sitting there, 
and then I'm looking up above where the engine room is now, and I see this great big empty space. Right, right. That's the way the Van balcony had, had, had designed it with the a horseshoe. Sorry. Right. And I thought, and we had just had some guys in our yard, some house movers, doing some uh, lifting one of our barges over there. And I, you know, they just using hydraulic jacks. And I thought, hmm, I wonder if we could just pick this thing up. And, and so was, then I made the phone call. Well, you I came talked to my to you. office, and you said, "Let's let's." Uh, I had I think what you said to me. You called me in the morning. And you said, "Couldn't sleep last night, and I had this idea. Let's lift the Elba." And I said, "That sounds good, but uh, how are we going to do it?" He said, "We're going to put a couple I beams underneath, and we'll just sit it on it." And I said, uh, "Not until we talk to Ben." And Ben came up that next day, and we had that meeting. And Ben said, okay, that sounds like a good idea, but we got to call the structural engineer to see if the balcony is going to hold it. So we got on the phone with the guy over in El Canto, who was the structural right, engineer. Structural. I can't remember his name, but he said, uh, uh, okay, he'd be over next week. And John said, no, we, we need you here now. <laughs> he said, I'll send my plane. And the guy said, I don't fly in small planes. I'll drive over this afternoon. And he, and he came over, and he looked at what John was suggesting. And he said, no, you can't do it with two I-beams. You need three. So I, what I remember then is that you, I got my approvals. You know, right. said it was OK to do it. And the house mover said, said to us, well, listen, we're busy right now, today. Will you move the elbow right over in the exact position right. where you want it? And we'll be in there tomorrow. Boy, it didn't take them no, long. No, they were. It was a day and a half, I think, when they, they had it up had there. They had things sitting up there, and, and then, then I, your guys put the beams in. I brought some of our guys over, and they welded the three beams in, set her back down on there, and we were good to go. Yeah, good to go. <coughs> yeah. And then, then you know, go back to to Dan's comment about all of the the exhibits. Um, you know, we had John was the the leader of the the lighthouse room and there was a big group of people there they wanted oh they wanted all kinds of electronic stuff in there and we couldn't afford that but but we uh, uh jerry richter uh, well that's, that's another whole other story <laughs> yep. about the and, about the mural and, and we were draw, we were, had three artists drawing the mural and i don't know if you've ever had three artists do one project yeah well it doesn't work no <laughs> it didn't work we basically that was my biggest headache in coordinating that right. was trying to was trying to eventually we tried to get that. I mean, but how do you get how do you get multiple artists to work on yeah, one mural? One here, one here, and one here, and nothing was working right. No, and <laughs> Jerry took over that project. And right. Basically, what you get now is was Jerry's mural. Yes, we had Jerry, Jerry, Jerry and then Jerry Richter. Jerry Richter, Richter yeah. did the 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 C project in there or the Bay project, and then uh, we took uh, uh, Peterson, um, Wally Peterson, Wally Peterson. And he said, "Well, how about if I do something in the in the uh, room down below with the with the bridge?" I said, "Okay." And uh, he was old, and <laughs> and I can remember he was up on scaffolding, and his, he he's kind of a, a self-taught uh, uh, painter. And he's a, basically he was a sign painter. Yeah, but and he's he done uh, not, but. and he did that. He started at one end, and he get up on that that uh, scaffolding. I go in and I say, "Oh, Grace, the guy's gonna fall." And he did that whole wall himself, and and it's perfect for the Elba because it's the Elba slug, you know, going through the the bridge, uh, and 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 that you know that worked out well. But the the light board that we came up with, uh, you, you know, was a, a way we could show where all the lighthouses were, um, right. and and, we and also, do it inexpensively. That's right. But we we also brought in the the iron worker who put in the who put in the platform. Mm -hmm. For the light, but we didn't right. have the light yet at that time. No, we, we just were, had we had a, a picture of the light in there. Yeah, right. and but we it was kind of an anticipatory thing that we were hoping, we were hoping we were for, ho hoping that we'd eventually get a Fresnel lens, which eventually came to light. But but ha, get that. Um, but uh, but in essence, we uh, we set that into place. And, and Hodges uh, built the uh, Hodges the, built the, the replica of the uh, Sherwood Point Lighthouse uh, in his barn, and then brought it in in pieces. And, Yep, and then we he welded it into place and right. everything into place over there. Right. So. so so that was that you know the way that kind of went, and then Dan and, and Orv took the room over here that we the we models. made the like models and a couple and little stories there is that uh, I knew these models were around town, and I knew Ellsworth had a bunch of them, and, uh, and we talked to him, and he says, well they're down at the old Milwaukee shoe building, so mm -hmm. a bunch of us 
one night when the pickup truck went down to the Milwaukee <laughs> Shoe Building and commandeered these models. And we were building a couple of little stories. We were building these stands, and the idea was just some plywood and put carpet on them. And I can remember, I forget the guy's name from Algoma, but he was a carpet layer. And I, in my infinite wisdom, was putting the carpet on wrong. You know, he said, you got to put it on this way instead of that way. And he helped us out there to carpet all of them. And then we put cement blocks in them, I think, mm -hmm. to make them stable so they wouldn't tip over. And one time, uh, Orville Shop and I got that... Um, sailboat model of Palmer Johnson's and um, I forget the lady that lives at Memorial Drive, uh, chef, chef's wife. Uh, oh, yeah. Chef Loman? Yeah, yeah chef Pat Loman. Pat Loman. Pat Said yeah. you guys can, if you come and get it, it's so horrible. This was like in February or March. Got in a truck and yep. carried this model out of her house and brought that in. That's why that Palmer Johnson model was there. Right. And uh, then we the museum had some models and we picked a few more up and built a case and that was really what we did there. Well, you know, when you asked me to fill up that gallery, that was a big gallery, by yep. the way, when you stood in there. So I was trying to think, what can we put in there? How are we going to fill it up? And one of our ideas, Doug, and of course, like you said, you and Christine approved this, but we built the outside of the Caprone's office building because we thought that was going to get torn down right you know pretty when we soon moved. when we moved so we built we built that as a front and then we put his office just like his original office was um, inside there but the one thing I had a couple things in storage that I wanted to get out of my buildings one was the recompression <laughs> chamber that was used on the Humphrey the raising of the Humphrey in 1943-44 and uh, another thing with his desk um, we wanted to put his original desk in there, and he always had a, a glass uh, covering a map of the Great Lakes that sat on top of his desk, and under that glass was a dollar bill. I don't know if you remember that, yep, Doug? Yeah, I do. It and disappeared he, once. he always told people that when, when I was <laughs> going in his office, that that's the dollar he paid uh, for the Humphrey, because they, they, they sold to him for a dollar after he raised it. Or that's what he had to pay for it for the insurance Selby, or whatever. Rates, whatever. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, yeah, that got stolen many times, Doug, and we finally <laughs> quit. <laughs> we quit putting the dollar under the glass. I think that's the only thing, only thievery we ever had, but uh, that I know of. But, but but I went, I went, I went to get uh, Marine Travel Lift. I went over to, to the Lamer right. Brothers. I don't know if you were with me, Doug, or not, but we they took me out in the back woods, out in a field. The first one. And there sat the original first travel lift that they ever built, mm -hmm. and it was in pretty tough shape. But they agreed that they would fix it up and would bring it over, and put it in in the um, in the museum. And again, the door wasn't big enough. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, anyway, I had our our crews come in there, and we built docks all throughout the base right. of the, <laughs> the floor area, painted the floor blue so it looked like water, and put the railings and the rope and right. uh, they put their travel lift over two docks and and we had several boats from from uh, the collection from the collection that we were able to put in different areas I think we put a lifeboat originally down on the end but we the did have a lifeboat at the end door. now we have a couple other and then others. who came up with the idea for the for the uh, boat building shop I think that was uh, me um, and we we wanted to have an interactive uh, and at that point uh, Jim Kowal was uh, very involved with the with the museum and the boat show, and he was building boats um, and uh, on his own. and uh, And Jim said that if we made a space, he would he would be in charge. He would take charge of what needed to be in the space, tool wise, and he would uh, um, do he would build a boat there so that we'd have something happening. So he built uh, um, the rowing skiff pat, which is part of the collection. I think it's in, still in the, in the museum down in that uh, north area mm -hmm. of the space. And uh, then at some point, I can't remember if it was the first year or the second year, um, the board determined that we, we would rename or we would name the boat shop, uh, uh, Jim's boat shop, after Jim Kowal because of the, all the work and he did. And, and that, that process led to the actual cl classes that are now done um, to build boats in the in the boat shop. The, so the engine room. Just a quick story about 
that area, I had an engine from one of our tugs that we dismantled and tore apart. And it was, I think it's what, about 15 feet long? Uh, the big column. Probably weighs, no, no, it's uh, the other so one. Oh, the diesel. The diesel engine, yeah. but um, another thing we brought over here, painted up, got it all cleaned up. And you remember that we were afraid of the weight on the concrete floor, right. Doug, moving it into the uh, mm -hmm. engine compartment. And then on the, on the other wall, we went over to Bay Ship. Remember, they were dismantling a freighter over there. Yep. And went in and took all these brass um, parts out of the engine room mm -hmm. and brought those over and put them on the wall. So we were scavenging all right. over the place for... And we had somebody at NW... One of the guys at NWTC, one of the instructors, came over and, and helped clean up some of the equipment and right. the motors and, the, uh, and, and help with that. And then we... We ended up later on putting the outboard motors in. We had done an exhibit up in Gills Rock um, with outboard motors, and when that was dismantled, we we brought those in to to change things. But uh, but yeah, it was a a, a real um, process of evolution. Um, uh, we did have some traveling exhibits that we brought into the uh, to the balcony, and then we decided that we would do our own temporary exhibits. Uh, along the way, uh, a couple of them we we actually then put out to other museums, and we had uh, Manitowoc Museum took uh, um, the uh, the photographic uh, exhibit that we had on the Ryerson, um, that was an absolutely wonderful um, exhibit of of uh, photography when the Ryerson was was mothballed. I suppose it's now back on the lakes, but. Uh, um, you, one other thing I can mention is the stained glass windows. Oh uh, yes. That, that were over the end there. Um, may I interrupt you and just give you my perspective? Sure. Of that? Be because I, yours is going to be a little different. Uh, <laughs> what John's talking about is uh, um, the the wonderful stained glass windows in in the stairway, uh, and also the the stained glass above each of the gallery entryways. And what happened was uh, uh, John's dad had died uh, the year before I was hired, and there had been a memorial fund set up. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and Hilda said, I want to use it for something at the museum. And I would say to Hilda every once in a while, I'd say, well, Hilda, what, what do you think we want to do? And she'd say, I don't know, but when I see it, I'll know. <laughs> and after we were on the, in the building process, um, I can't remember if we were really open at that point or not, but Hilda came over one day and she said, I know what I want to do, Doug. I want to have some sort of stained glass window in that stairway. And the windows were up um, and, and installed. It was just clear glass. And I said, all right, well, how do you want to do it? And she said, I don't know, but we should have a, a competition of some yeah. sort. Right. So I talked to uh, uh, Tavani Hartman, at, at, who was the director of the Miller. We got a, a small committee of, of people together. Uh, I think John or Hilda probably sat on the yeah. committee. Uh, Bonnie, I was on it, and one or two other people, and we, we sent out invitations to stained glass people uh, all over the area um, and we had I don't know 10 12 different uh, uh, proposals. proposals come in uh, some of which were way out there you know others were very specific uh, and uh, we we ended up with it was kind of like this two different uh, people one was they were both in Appleton uh, the glass onion was the one that did the one the big one I can't remember the name of the other uh, organization and that did the that we gave the second bid to, uh, but I think it was the Glass Onion that uh, that did the main one. But uh, they they came in and then uh, the funds from from Charlie's uh, memorial were used to pay for the the main window, and because we couldn't really we we liked the other group so much. We said, well, how about putting stained glass windows above, and the transom windows above each of the galleries? So we, we hired the, uh, or commissioned the.